You know, it seems like every week there's something new <laughs> in the building. Have y'all noticed? This, you know, one week everything got painted. One week uh, there was these shrubbery. Another week there were these rocks. And then now, I don't know if you noticed it, but we got new chairs. Uh, and before class, I only half hear things before I teach class because I'm worried about class. But uh, before class, I, I'm pretty sure I heard Stan ask Juan if he could break his chair in for him. Uh, you know, it's fun to get new things, but sometimes they need to be broken in. I get it. Anyway, it's a blessing that we have been able to uh, upgrade this building and, and worship in a place that's this comfortable. And uh, I, I don't think we need to take that for granted. We need to remember to thank God for those things. Um, also, I want to remind you, if you have the opportunity, please come back tonight. Uh, Brent Duncan is teaching on the humanity of Christ. I, I want you to know I've heard Brent talk about this a little, and I'm really excited to hear him talk about it a lot. So if you don't go 45 minutes, we're ripping us off. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm, Brent is going to do an outstanding job, and if you are able to be here at 5 o'clock tonight, please make a point to come and, uh, and hear that lesson on the humanity of Christ. It will be a blessing uh, to all of us. Um, I have to say, as has already been said, happy Mother's Day. Because today is Mother's Day, and mothers, mothers are awesome. Uh, there's, there's no getting around that, right? Mothers are an incredibly beautiful thing that God has uh, put on the earth. When he designed the world, if he didn't put mothers in there, things just would not work as well. You know, can all the fathers say amen to that? Right? Like, listen, mothers are such a blessing. And one of the things about, about your mom as you get older, you realize, uh, what, what do you realize as you get older? Mom was always right, wasn't she? Right? You realize, man, maybe not always, but you realize mom was right a lot. Right? And sometimes you might even uh, catch yourself hearing her advice in your ears as you, uh, as you are going through your life. I, every time I got dropped off at school, my mom said, remember who you are, make good choices, I love you. Every time I go somewhere, I get out of the car and those words ring in my ears, Make good choices. You know, that was good advice. Um, you, you, you notice uh, as you grow up and you experience things, you think back and you go, man, remember when mom told me about that? I wish I would have listened. As you get older, you also notice something similar as it pertains to the Bible. As you grow up, you realize the Bible is full of a lot of good advice. And as you get older, you realize the Bible is right about a lot. <laughs> uh, we may even say everything. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 20 is where we're going to be this morning. So if you want to turn over there and get your Bibles ready, that's where we're going to camp out. The Bible has a tremendous amount of good advice in it. And, and what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the story of uh, David and Jonathan. And we're going to draw some good advice out of uh, this story that we, that we read. So 1 Samuel chapter 20. For time's sake, we are not going to read through uh, the entire story, but we're going to give a little bit of context as to what was going on at this time uh, in, in this part of the Bible. So uh, 1, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter, um, chapter 16 and 17, uh, we have David being anointed as the future king, which is a big deal, uh, because David was not the current king's son. Uh, isn't that odd? You know, usually the king, whoever he is, his son is next in line for the throne. And so this is a big deal in 1 Samuel chapter 16, because God has rejected the current king, whose name is Saul, and he said, I'm going to anoint a new king. And so while the current king is still alive, the new king is anointed. That is cause for some tension, right? So David gets anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and then in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David kills Goliath. Uh, this is a big deal, right? This is like one of the most famous Bible stories ever. It's, it's a pretty big deal that, that David, you know, the little shepherd boy who's going to be the future king, shows up in this battle, and everyone else is afraid of this giant, and David kills the giant. Even Saul was afraid of the giant, the current king, and David kind of showed him up here. 
So David kills Goliath, and then, then there becomes this little, this little song that people are singing about David and Saul, the future. The, right? So they're singing a song about the current king and the future king, and it goes like this. Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his tens of thousands. Right? There's a little, little saying that's going around. And what are they really saying here? They're saying David is ten times the warrior that Saul is. Man, that adds a little bit more tension to the current king, future king dilemma we already see. So not only is David anointed before Saul uh, is, is dead, not only does Saul have descendants that he would rather continue as the king, not only has David shown Saul up in, in killing Goliath and defeating the Philistines, there's the whole culture, the whole city, the whole nation at this time is singing a song about how David is 10 times the man that Saul is. And so that sets us up uh, in, in, well, chapter 18, there's one little detail that, that we see, and then we'll be set up for chapter 20. In chapter 18, David meets a guy named Jonathan, uh, and we're just going to read these couple of verses, verse 1 through 5 in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Uh, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul sent him over the men, of, uh, the men of war, and this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So we see here, Saul, uh, or David and Jonathan are, the Bible describes it, knitted together, intimately woven together in their own souls. They are the best of friends. They are, they are such close friends, it would be difficult for you to say anything negative about their relationship. And so um, who is this Jonathan character? Jonathan is the son of Saul, the current king. So as if we didn't have enough tension in this story already, add to David being 10 times the warrior according to the nation, David showing up Saul, David being anointed before, before Saul had died. Add to all of that, David being best friends with the son of the current king. I mean, this is what movies are made of, guys. This is how to build tension in a movie. And this tension, we're not going to get to the whole end of the story today, but really, it, it reaches a boiling point here in chapter 20 uh, before it boils over in a couple chapters later. But chapter 20, we see uh, David having to flee. The very first verse of 1 Samuel chapter 20 says, Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah, and he came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt, and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? Jonathan responds, Far be it from me, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. So here, here, here's what's happening here. David has uh, picked up on the tension. And, and the tension has reached a boiling point in chapter 19 where Saul has decided it's, it's time for David to go. Uh, this guy has shown me up with Goliath. He's trying to take my kingdom from me and my family. And, and it's time for, time for him to go. He's, we need to deal with him. And so he tries to kill him. And he's going to continue to try and kill him for several chapters throughout this book. Um, and so David catches on. It's, it's not usually a secret when someone's trying to kill you. David catches on, and he comes to Jonathan, his best friend, and also the man who is trying to kill him's son. And he comes to Jonathan, and he says, hey, like, what did I do that is so wrong that your dad wants me dead? Okay? And Jonathan is in complete denial. <laughs> he says, listen, he doesn't. My dad doesn't do anything without talking to me about it. If, if he wanted to kill you, I'd know about it. And they actually go back and forth a couple of times throughout the verses. Ultimately, what they end up deciding, and like I said, we're, we're not going to read it all for time's sake, but what they end up deciding is that David's life is it's a pretty important thing to mess around with. So they're going to not take 
too big of a risk. Saul was holding a feast in his house, uh, and David was expected to be there. And, and David was apprehensive about going. And so what they decided to do was, David said, I'm going to stay hidden for a while and not go to this feast. And we'll see how your dad responds. And if he responds positively, you're going to come out, Jonathan, and you're going to shoot some arrows into this field. And if you tell the young lad, those arrows are beyond you, that means I'm in trouble. But if you tell the young lad, those arrows are beside you, that means I'm good to go. So they develop this code, right? They're, they're going to try and, and, and make sure that Saul wants David dead before they start acting uh, too rash. They execute the plan. Uh, Saul holds the feast. David does not show up. His place was empty, verse 25 says. And Jonathan is feeling out the room, all right? So let's pick up, um, let's pick up in verse 26. Uh, well, let's back up. Let's do verse 24. So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seat, as at other times, on the seat uh, by the wall. Jonathan sat opposite, and Abner sat by Saul's side. But David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He is not clean. Surely he's not clean. Uh, so, so Saul's assumption here is that David must have been unclean according to their law. And that must be why he's not showing up for the feast. So he lets day one slide by. Verse 27 says, But on the second day, after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has the son of Jesse, uh, why, why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered Saul, This was another wrinkle in the plan. When Saul asked where David was, Jonathan was supposed to say, he's at his parents' house. And so he answers appropriately. He says, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city. And my brother has commanded me to be there. So now, if I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. So, executed the plan perfectly. What is Saul's response? Depending on Saul's response right here, they will know if David's life is in jeopardy or if it is not. And we, the reader, already know it very much is. So verse 30 is Saul's response. It says, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. He left no doubt, all right? He left absolutely no... I mean, he starts off with some pretty intense name-calling, son of a perverse, rebellious woman. I don't know what that would translate to in our modern culture, but you can imagine. And, and, and he calls him, he says, you've chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness. And then he finishes it up with absolutely no doubt, bring David to me. I want to kill him, right? He shall surely die. So Jonathan, I guess, I don't know if he's unconvinced or if he thinks maybe his father can be persuaded, but he responds and says, uh, then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? And Saul's response is, well, he's done a couple of things I didn't really like. No, 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 no. Verse 33, but Saul hurled a spear at Jonathan to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. As if Saul saying, I'm going to kill David, wasn't enough. When he hurled a spear at his son, that was when Jonathan knew. All right, he means business. So this is, this is a, a really tragic story. Uh, Jonathan then leaves the table. Uh, he, he, you can almost see it happening, can't you? Like it's a really awkward family dinner here. Uh, Saul throws the spear. He misses because apparently he wasn't a very good shot. And Jonathan just excuses himself from the table and leaves. I mean, like you can see this had to be an intense moment. Saul's anger is described as being kindled. 
Jonathan is nearly killed by his own father, and then he is charged with the task the next morning to go out and finish the plan that him and David had put into place. So he goes out the next morning, he shoots the arrows, tells the boy, run and get the arrows, and then he tells the boy, the arrows are beyond you, which David knew was the code that meant Saul wants you dead. So when the boy grabs the arrows, Saul or David and Jonathan uh, have an embrace. They share an embrace. There's weeping. And they know that what this means is they're not going to be able to be friends anymore because Jonathan will have to live in the house of his father and David will have to live on the run for the foreseeable future. It's kind of a sad story. And, and by kind of, I mean, it's, it's an absolutely tragic story. But like we started talking about in the beginning, the Bible is full of good advice. Just like mom always gave us good advice, the Bible is full of good advice. Mom used to always say, go make friends. Did your mom ever tell you that? I, I, really, I remember my mom telling me when I got older, of course I didn't know this when I was five, six, seven years old, but when I got older she told me that she would always send me out into the, the parking lot, or the parking lot, she would send me out into the front yard uh, with candy so that I could make friends, right? Like, you just send them out with some snacks because apparently I wasn't charming enough as a five, six, seven year. Anyway, um, no, she sent me out into the, into the friends and make friends, right? That was an important thing from, well, listen, the story of David, Jonathan, and Saul also teaches us this valuable lesson. In fact, each character in this story teaches us a lesson uh, by themselves. So the first lesson we learn is similar to like mom always said, there is incredible value in a friend. Um, David teaches us this lesson, uh, the value of a friend. Friends can save your life. If you don't believe me just saying that, go reread that story. Where would David be, do you think, if it wasn't for Jonathan? Where might, it, it, it's possible that David went to the banquet. And it's possible that Saul's poor aim turned into really good aim. And he hit, he hit David with a spear and David is dead. It's possible that if uh, David didn't have Jonathan on the inside, that he would have uh, been on the run to the wrong place. Or he wouldn't have been able to get a head start running from Saul who wanted him dead. There's a number of scenarios here. But every single scenario is helped by David having a friend like Jonathan who was willing to help him in a time of need. Friends can save your life. They can, they can save your life in, in less dramatic ways as well. Have, have any of you had one of those days that you just kind of wish was done by 12 o'clock? Do you know what I'm talking about? You wake up and you kind of get through a, a sleepy morning. Maybe you wake up hard. And then by noon, you're just like, all right, now I'm ready for bed. This day is the worst. You have to know what I'm talking I know I'm not the only one who's had those days, all right? Have you noticed that on days when you are having a rough day, you want to go to bed, you want to just be done with the day, when you have something that night that you have to go do with people, you generally feel better after that? I've noticed this. I don't know, maybe, maybe my experience isn't exactly the same as all of yours, but I've noticed that spending time with friends on bad days can turn bad days into better days. I'm not the only one that has noticed this. Psychology... Um, has also affirmed this notion. Uh, they were studying depression, and, and one of the things they learned in studying depression is that one of the very best things you can do if you are dealing with uh, clinical depression is spend time with other people. And this checks out uh, with everything that the Bible teaches us, doesn't it? In the beginning, what was the first thing that God ever said wasn't good? It's man to be alone. And all the introverts in the room just kind of pulled back a little bit, right? Listen, when I hear it's not good for man to be alone, I give a really loud amen because I'm an extrovert of extroverts, okay? I, 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 I get energized by spending time with people. I enjoy being out and about. I don't, I don't love being by myself. I don't need that quiet time. But my sister Alexa, that all of you know, is not that way. She is, loves people, no issue there, great with people. I love Alexa. But Alexa has told me on a number of occasions, if she is out and about for too long, she needs a little bit of time to recharge. 
right? There's, there is a need for my introverted sister to have some alone time. But what does God say? He says it's not good for man to be alone. I don't believe he's meaning that if you're an extrovert, there's something wrong with you, okay? I think what God is saying here very clearly is that it is not good for man to live in isolation. Again, this is, this is something that we see in our world today. Did you know that there are certain countries in which solitary confinement is actually considered cruel and unusual punishment? You think cruel and unusual punishment, you might think like, I don't know, waterboarding or pulling off your fingernails or stubbing someone's toe repeatedly. I don't know. You think of cruel and unusual. You think of a certain set of torture, right? Solitary confinement falls into that category in certain uh, areas of the world. Why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be isolated. There is value in friendship. Look at the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. I should have had it marked. Look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a book that was written by... uh, that was written by Solomon. Uh, Solomon, as he falls into the timeline, is the son of David. Um, and so that's kind of a, kind of a cool note. But uh, Solomon was given this opportunity by God to have anything granted to him that he wanted. And Solomon asked God for wisdom to rule as a good king. And because of that, God blessed him in more ways than he could fathom made him the richest man to ever live, gave him peace in his kingdom, gave him uh, everything he could ever want. And Solomon, at the end of his life, writes this book of Ecclesiastes reflecting on the life he'd lived. And you know what he says? Oh, everything is pointless. I mean, he starts off, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Solomon, who had everything you could ever want, in the first two chapters, basically lists all the things that you could ever want and says it's useless and it's pointless. And by the end of the book, he says the only thing worth doing is serving God. But there's a little little thing there in chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes that is not pointless. In, in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9, Solomon writes that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Now, did you know that they've done studies on, uh, on farm animals? And what they found is that two plus two equals five. Right? You would expect if one know, donkey, one donkey could pull 200 pounds and another donkey could pull 200 pounds, that if you yoke them together, they would pull 400 pounds, right? Because we can all do basic math. But what they actually found is that if you yoke two donkeys together and have them pull 500 pounds, they do it well. Now, how does that make sense? Well, it's really interesting that this verse says why that makes sense, because two are better than one, because two have a good reward for their labor. Uh, Verse 10, if, if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two can withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now this is, this is just awesome. Solomon, at the end of his life, reflecting on everything that he has done in his life, says, Everything on this earth is useless except for serving God, and friends are really important. I mean, that's a beautiful message from Solomon. And it's a lesson that David teaches us here in this story as well. The value of a friend cannot be understated. And this is something that applies to us in the church as well. I believe firmly this is why God gave us the church. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 Paul teaches us to bear one another's burdens. We're supposed to be people who are able to rely on each other and understand the value of both having a good friend and the opposite of that, being a good friend. So David teaches us the value of a friend, just like mom used to always say, go make friends. The second person in the story we're going to learn from is Solomon. Um, My mom always emphasized the importance of sharing 
uh, from a very young age, and I'm, I'm learning this, I'm, I'm not a mom, but I have a daughter and I'm trying to teach her to share and it's, it's going okay, it's not great. You can ask Kyle and Sarah, you know, she doesn't like to share very much. Uh, you know, my mom always tried to instill in me the importance of sharing and giving. Jonathan teaches us a very similar uh, lesson. When we read through Jonathan's story, we see the blessing that it is to sacrifice. Now, you think about uh, Jonathan. What did he sacrifice throughout this story? Well, let's think of it like this. What did he stand to gain if David died? A throne. And everything that comes with a throne, right? He stood to gain a, a place in that nation as a king which came with power and possessions and influence and wealth. And, I mean, listen, Jonathan had a lot riding on this whole David's the new king thing, all right? He, he had, like, his whole life set as the heir to the throne. And yet, he chooses to be a good friend to David and sacrifices all of that for the sake of his friend. Jesus said a lot of things while he was on the earth. You know that he, we, have, we have four gospels and then John uh, writes at the end of his gospel that if, if all the books in the world couldn't contain all the things that Christ did while he was on the earth. And so Jesus said a lot of things and he said a lot of things really well. He had a mastery of words. Jesus would send people away marveling at his answers to their questions. And yet, you notice, he never says, I'm sorry, right? He never, he never takes the time to apologize for things. Uh, he, never, he never apologizes for his teaching being too harsh. Just a couple of examples. Uh, you, you see him interact with the rich young ruler, right? And the rich young ruler comes and he says, what can I do uh, to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And he says, keep the law. And the rich young ruler says, done it. And he says, Okay, well, go sell everything you have and follow me. And the rich young ruler walks away sorrowful. Joseph, in that scenario, would say, hey, man, I'm sorry, come back. Just sell half. We'll work up to selling all that you have. Hey, that, I'm sorry, that was a bit steep. All that you have, I get that's a lot of faith to expect right off the bat. Jesus doesn't. He doesn't apologize for what he asks of the rich young ruler. Instead, he lets him make his own decision. You think about the woman who was uh, giving of her, of her two mites or her two copper coins. Understand that scenario. This woman is giving all that she has to a Jewish religious organization that would be as corrupt as any religious organization ever was. They weren't keeping the law at that point by any stretch. Their high priest didn't get to be a high priest forever. He was elected year to year. They were kind of mingling in Roman government with Jewish government. They were binding parts of the law that weren't even written in the law. And yet this woman is walking up and giving everything that she had to that religious institution. Again, if Joseph was in that story, he would say, Miss, save your money. They don't need it or deserve it. No, oh, hey, listen, I'm sorry. You, that, that was the wrong thing to do. Jesus doesn't. He doesn't hold her back from giving. He doesn't hold her back from sacrificing all that she had for the sake of a horribly corrupt religious institution. And, and even his 12 apostles, his disciples that are with him, do you know that Jesus tells them that they will drink the cup that he is going to drink? And that it's a nice metaphorical way of saying that you're going to die like I'm going to die. You're going to be persecuted like I'm going to be persecuted. And he doesn't apologize. If I was telling someone that you're, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to die. Listen, I remember b before Courtney and I got married, and I told her, I said, I, I, I want to be in ministry, and, and in ministry there's a lot of difficulties. You know, you're dealing with people. It's a messy business, and sometimes things can be really hard. And I, I gave her a couple of uh, examples, you know, if we're dealing with kids, you know, there are going to be kids who are uh, dealing with depression. There, there may be kids who are even, you know, dealing with thoughts of hurting themselves. And, and we're going to have to talk them through this and counsel them through some of these things. And what I was doing, 
I was apologizing to her for how difficult this could be and asking her if she really wanted to take part in it. Jesus didn't do that. He never apologized for what was to come. And he wasn't talking about emotionally draining work that is difficult and challenging and, 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 and hard. He was talking about giving your life to follow him. Why would Jesus not have some apology behind that? What, why would he not hedge his bets a little bit? The answer is very simple and very clear. It's because he would never rob someone of their blessing. And sacrifice for the sake of Christ is always a blessing. Jesus is never going to take someone's blessing from them. And sacrifice for Christ is always a blessing. You remember last time, that last thing that David taught us about the value of a friend, I said psychology has, has borne that out. Well, psychology has actually also proven this point as well. Um, as they were studying, same study. The same study on depression, they found that the second best thing to do was spend time with other people. You know what they found the number one thing to do if you are struggling with depression? Go serve other people. Clinical studies, that was the number one result. The most effective way to battle depression is to go serve somebody else. Because like David, like Jonathan teaches us, sacrifice is a blessing. I want you to imagine for one more second, what would happen if Jonathan hadn't, uh, if he hadn't chosen to be a good friend and he hadn't sacrificed? He would have inherited the entire kingdom, likely. But at what cost? Don't you think there would have been nights when he thought about the betrayal of his best friend? When he remembered that time, he said, David, it's all, it's all clear, come to the feast and his father killed his best friend? Don't you think that would haunt Jonathan? Do you think it would be worth it? I can tell you what Solomon said. He said it's not. Sacrifice for the sake of Christ is always a blessing. We need to understand that just like Jonathan did, that giving of ourselves for others is just what Christ did for us. And if we're going to be Christians, we need to be like Jonathan. The third thing. Third thing, mom often told me not to be selfish. Now, usually this one wasn't as much good advice as it was a rebuke, uh, but I believe this is an excellent point that we learn from this story. So we learn from David the value of friendship. We learn from Jonathan the blessing of sacrifice, and we learn from Saul the danger of selfishness. Uh, who was Saul thinking about this entire time? Well, he was sick and tired of David showing him up. And Saul was so tired of David that he wanted to kill him. Listen, the danger of selfishness is where it will lead you. Uh, look at James chapter 3. If you want to flip over there quickly. If you hit the concordance, you have gone too far. James chapter 3 and verse 16. James writing says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Uh, another translation I read said that there will, be, there will be chaos and evil. Listen, do we not see that in the example of Saul right here? Saul has let his selfish desire to remain king and to keep the kingly line, he's let that selfishness creep into his life and then even to the point of not only calling his son some awful names, but hurling a spear at... Take a second. I don't know if you have children or if you have pets or if you have nieces and nephews that you love, but just, just what would it take for you to throw a spear at them? That's, that's evil. <laughs> that's, that's chaos and evil, is it not? Selfishness takes you down this path and leads you to evil and pain. If Saul had succeeded in killing Jonathan, just imagine, just imagine how he felt that night. I mean, he missed, right? He missed, and he didn't kill Jonathan. But 
in his moment of sobriety, and we know Saul had moments of sobriety, right? Saul was angry enough to kill David, but there are times throughout his pursuing of David through the next several chapters of 1 Samuel where his life is spared or something happens and he vows to not pursue David anymore. He has moments of clarity. I believe Saul had moments of clarity following this awkward family dinner where he attempted to kill his son. What do you think was running through his mind? tell you what would be running through my mind I'm so glad I missed I cannot believe I threw a spear what was I thinking pain and chaos are a result of selfish desire just like James tells us as we get older we look back and sometimes we say man I wish I had listened to mom it's just the truth and all the kids that are thinking I'm wrong about this it will come true. It, just, it always happens, right? You look back and you think, man, I wish I would have listened to the good advice that my mom had given me. The challenge today, though, is don't look back on your life and say, man, I wish I had listened to the good advice that the Bible had given me. Because while mom's words are incredible advice, God's words lead to eternal life. And if we are going to live by God's words, we need to not look back and say, I wish I had listened to the good advice in the scripture. So the challenge today, if you need to obey the gospel and listen to the words that lead to eternal life, pick up the book, read it, and listen to it. And if you need help doing that, we can take your Bible and show you what it says. If you need anything else from the congregation, whether it's prayers or whether it's to be restored as a faithful Christian, Whatever you need, now is a time of invitation where you can let that be made known to the church. And we have an opportunity to be a good friend to you because friends are incredibly valuable. We have an opportunity, if you have need, to sacrifice of ourselves and give to you because sacrifice is always a blessing. And we have an opportunity to be selfless and not selfish and care for the desires of our brothers and sisters. Like Paul says in Galatians 6, 2, and bear one another's burdens. Whatever you need this morning, you can tell, uh, let it be made known while we stand and while we sing.